้ในปี1946นิยามของพิพิธภัณฑ์ได้ถูกขยายเพื่อให้รองรับความเปลี่ยนแปลงของสังคมมากขึ้นจึงทำให้บทบาทของพิพิธภัณฑ์ถูกปรับเปลี่ยนให้มีหน้าที่มากกว่าการเป็นสถานที่จัดเก็บสงวนรักษาโบราณวัตถุในปี1961ไอคอมได้เพิ่มนิยามด้านการศึกษาว่าเป็นงานสำคัญของพิพิธภัณฑ์และในปี2012ยูเนสโกได้เผยแพร่นโยบายเกี่ยวกับบทบาทของพิพิธภัณฑ์ด้านการศึกษาและการท่องเที่ยวซึ่งบทบาทด้านการศึกษานั้นสัมพันธ์กับความเปลี่ยนแปลงทางสังคมโดยเฉพาะในศตวรรษที่21พิพิธภัณฑ์ต้องเผชิญกับความท้าทายว่าจะทำอย่างไรเพื่อขับเน้นบทบาทด้านการศึกษาให้เด่นชัดขึ้นผ่านการทบทวนบทบาทและหน้าที่ของผู้ที่มีส่วนเกี่ยวข้องว่าใครมีหน้าที่ในการให้การศึกษาในพิพิธภัณฑ์พันธรักษ์นักการศึกษาหรือครูในขณะเดียวกันจะต้องคิดว่าทำอย่างไรให้การเรียนรู้ในพิพิธภัณฑ์สามารถมีบทบาทในการส่งเสริมการเรียนรู้ของผู้คนได้ตลอดชีวิตพิพิธภัณฑ์จะสอดรับกับการศึกษาในระบบและช่วยเติมเต็มการศึกษานอกระบบได้อย่างไรพิพิธภัณฑ์จะสร้างสรรค์การเรียนรู้ให้แก่ผู้ชมที่แตกต่างกันได้อย่างไรโดยเฉพาะเด็กครอบครัวผู้พิการผู้สูงอายุผู้ด้อยโอกาสในสังคมและผู้ที่มีความสนใจเฉพาะด้านได้มากกว่าที่เป็นอยู่ Museum Education Now 2017จึงเกิดขึ้นเพื่อร่วมขับเคลื่อนงานการศึกษาในพิพิธภัณฑ์เพื่อให้ประเทศไทยเป็นสังคมแห่งการเรียนรู้พบกับองค์ปาถกเราทำพิพิธภัณฑ์ในแบบที่เราเรียนรู้เรื่องเล่าในฐานะสะพานเชื่อมระหว่างการศึกษาและนิทรรศการการศึกษาในและนอกกำแพงพิพิธภัณฑ์กรณีศึกษาจากสิงคโปร์พิพิธภัณฑ์จะเปลี่ยนชีวิตผู้คนได้หรือไม่สำรวจศักยภาพการศึกษาในพิพิธภัณฑ์ภัสสะศึกษาพิพิธภัณฑ์จะเป็นแหล่งการเรียนรู้ทางสุนทรียะได้หรือไม่การนำเสนอผลงานพิพิธภัณฑ์ในฐานะการศึกษานอกระบบและแหล่งเรียนรู้ตามอัธยาศัยบริบทที่เปลี่ยนไปในงานการศึกษาของพิพิธภัณฑ์การจัดการการเรียนรู้ให้พิพิธภัณฑ์เป็นทางเลือกของการศึกษาในระบบและในทางกลับกันงานการศึกษาในภูมิภาคเอเชียและอื่นๆการใช้สื่อเพื่อการเรียนรู้เกมเพื่อการศึกษาการวิจัยและพัฒนาการเสวนาโต๊ะกลมครูกับการใช้พิพิธภัณฑ์เป็นแหล่งการเรียนรู้การละครกับงานพิพิธภัณฑ์งานการศึกษากับพิพิธภัณฑ์ท้องถิ่นการแสดงสื่อการเรียนรู้จากพิพิธภัณฑ์ต่างๆพร้อมถแถลงการ Museum Education Now 2017 Bangkok เพื่อผลักดันให้งานการศึกษาในพิพิธภัณฑ์เด่นชัดและมีบทบาทมากขึ้นร่วมขับเคลื่อนโดย Hello. Thank you. 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 ในวันนี้เราก็จะมีกิจกรรมเหมือนเมื่อวานนะครับคือในช่วงเช้าเราก็จะมีวิทยากรจากต่างประเทศ2ท่านนะครับมามานำเสนอนะครับและช่วงบ่ายเราก็จะมีห้องย่อยๆนะครับที่เป็นห้องเสวนากลุ่มนะครับหรือ panel discussion แต่ว่าก่อนจะเริ่มนะครับผมขอประชาสัมพันธ์นิดนึงครับเดี๋ยวช่วงหลังจากเซสชันสุดท้ายในช่วงบ่ายนะครับซึ่งเราเราประมาณ5โมงเย็นนะครับ
เราก็จะมีพิธีปิดที่นี่นะครับที่ในห้องนี้ซึ่งเราจะมีการร่วมกันอ่านคำประกาศของอในเรื่อง Museum Education ผมก็อยากจะขอเรียนเชิญทุกๆท,ท่านมาร่วมในพิธีปิดด้วยกันนะครับซึ่งเราเราจะมีการอ่าน,านคำประกาศร่วมกันแล้วก็จะมีเมื่อวานหลายๆท่านคงได้ไปได้แสดงความคิดเห็นต่อเรื่องนี้ผ่านว,วิดีโอและสิ่งที่เขียนนะครับเราก็จะเอา,เอามาใช้ร่วมในในใน,ในวันนี้ด้วยนะครับก็อย่าลืมมาร่วมกันแสดงเจตนาลมว่าด้วยเรื่องการศึกษาในงานพิพิธภัณฑ์ร่วมกันนะครับอีกเรื่องหนึ่งนะครับก็คือเรื่องเรื่องหูฟังแปลนะครับก็ถ้าใครยังไม่ได้รับนะครับเรามีหูฟังสําหรับการแปลหยุดที่จุดลงทะเบียนสามารถไปรับได้นะครับแต่ว่าก็จะขอรบกวนให้ให้คืนเดี๋ยวเราจะมีจุดคืนอยู่ข้างหน้าห้องนี้นะครับก่อนจะรับประทานอาหารกลางวันนะครับก็มี2เรื่องที่จะแจ้งให้ทราบนะครับและก็งั้นเดี๋ยวเรามาเริ่มกันเลยนะครับก็ในช่วงเช้าวันนี้นะครับวิทยากรท่านแรกของเราก็คือวิทยากรที่มาจากประเทศไต้หวันนะครับที่จะเมื่อกี้เราเห็นในวิทยาแล้วนะครับก็คือประเด็นที่ท่านจะมาพูดก็คือเรื่องชื่อหัวข้อนะครับก็คือว่าพิพิธภัณฑ์สามารถเปลี่ยนชีวิตของเราได้หรือไม่นะครับสำรวจศักยภาพของการงานการศึกษาในพิพิธภัณฑ์นะครับ Now we're gonna start the day with our first keynote speaker um, and the keynote speech will will be on can museum change lives exploring the potentials of museum education and our um, 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 keynote speaker for this session is Miss Ui s e l i n She is a section chief education and outreach program department of education, exhibition, and information services of the National Palace Museum, Taiwan. Please welcome Ms. Lin. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here sharing some of our experiences of museum educational programs at the National Palace Museum in Taiwan. I'd like to thank the um, committee and particularly Professor Nok for inviting and having me here. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting some of your delegates who came to visit the museum last year. Uh, but I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the National Palace Museum in Taiwan, so I'm going to do a very, very quick uh, overview. The National Palace Museum uh, is one of the most renowned Chinese art collections in the world, and its collection is built upon former imperial collection that was built up by several different emperors in imperial China. Part of the imperial collection was moved to Taiwan in 1948 and 1949, and the, re, uh, the museum reopened itself as the National Palace Museum in Taipei in 1965. Nowadays, we collect close to 700,000 pieces of artworks, including ancient Chinese paintings, calligraphy, ceramics, jades, bronzes, rare books, documents, etc. And our annual visitor number from last year is close to 4.7 million visitors, which is too many for comfort, if you ask me. Luckily, we have a sister museum, um, which was opened at the end of 2015 in the southern part of Taiwan, uh, our Southern Branch Museum. In the first year since its opening, it has attracted close to 1.5 million visitors, and we are hoping that eventually they'll share some of the visitor numbers uh, in Taipei. So here you see a picture of the National Palace Museum in Taipei, as well as the National Palace Museum's Southern Branch in Jiayi in southern Taiwan. Now, the following two statements uh, issued and published by AAM, the American Alliance of Museums, have greatly shaped my early career as a museum educator. By the way, I have been a museum educator for a very long time. I have worked in museum education for over 20 years at the National Palace Museum. The first uh, publication was from Museums for a New Century that AAM published in 1984, and I'm sure many of you must be familiar with this passage from the book that if collections are the heart of museums, what we have come to call education is the spirit. So in short, if a museum has a wonderful collection but has no educational missions in mind, then it's a museum without the spirit. The next uh, publication is Excellence and Equity, which AAM published in 1992. In this policy statement, AAM placed the educational role at the very 
core of museum services. From then on, uh, museum educational programs or education department are no longer just a subsidiary, a supplementary, secondary existence. They became the core values and core missions of museum of different types and in different regions. It's no wonder then in uh, Icon's definition of a museum, which uh, this is the 2007 version that they put on their website right now, that whether the museum performs its function of acquisition, conservation, research, communication, and exhibition, they should all be performed with the purposes of education, study, and enjoyment in mind. And of course, education, study, and enjoyment are all related to educational functions, which means that ICOM is also placing education at the very core of uh, the museum functions. There has been a recent shift of definition of museum education in the last, uh, perhaps the last 20 years. Uh, more and more museum scholars and educators are using learning instead of education to define our learning activities. What are the differences? I'll just put it in very, very simple terms. Learning uh, implies that our visitors, our learners, take an active instead of a passive role in the meaning making processes and that they bring with them their previous knowledges, whether that be their personal identity, their previous life experiences, etc., to the meaning making process as well. And Anna Cutler from the uh, Tate Britain and Tate um, Modern in London summarized the following six points of shift of museum education, from the passive to participative. Now we expect our visitors, we want our visitors to participate fully and actively. From standardized to personalized, we realize that each individual visitor is different. They come with different expectations. They come with uh, different uh, preferences, preferences of learning needs and learning styles. There is no one standardized performance for that fits all. We must take each individual visitor differently. From the didactic to co-learning, so the transmission of knowledge is no longer just a one-way street from museum experts to the recipients and the visitors just receive passively. We now, know, we now know and want our visitors to play an active role uh, in uh, participation, uh, educational activities. From knowledge acquisition to knowledge application, from a single authorial voice to plural voices, we also welcome many voices and many different interpretations from private knowledge to public access, so that the museum knowledge is no longer just a private domain owned by a, a couple of museum experts, but they are a, an open access welcoming all who are interested to use and interpret. So what do museum um, educators do nowadays in response to this uh, shift of museum education? First of all, they have to face far more diverse audience than ever. As we recognize that each individual visitor is different, we must always design and execute our educational programs with social inclusion and accessibility in mind. We must uh, accommodate differences of gender, age, demographics, cultural background, learning preferences, and styles. We also have to accommodate visitors with special needs. I'm going to show you some of the uh, images uh, that uh, share with you the, some of the educa educational programs that we do at the MPM in response to this shift of museum education. But I'm sure those of you who are museum educators uh, at Thailand Museums here must also have very similar or even more creative and diverse programs for your audiences. So we nowadays have to accommodate the differences of ages we serve uh, visitors young and old. In Taiwan, particularly, because we are facing a very serious problem of a rapidly aging society, will be a very, very, very old society in just a four or five years. So the museum is responding to this social change and is offering more and more programs to our senior citizens. Sometimes not just to the senior citizens themselves, but also to their family members or their caregivers who accompany them to the programs. There's also an increase of new immigration population in Taiwanese society, so we are also responding to this new social change. These are mostly women from Southeast Asian countries that married uh, Taiwanese husbands. 
but many of them are so dominated by the male chauvinistic culture in Taiwan that they are not allowed to speak their mother tongues at home. They are not allowed to teach their children the mother tongues, which is very sad. So in this program we uh, offer to the new immigrants and their family, this is actually a session about traditional Chinese toys. We asked the, the immigrants to bring toys from their hometown and share with them with everybody present. So you see a mother from Indonesia is sharing a toy she brought from her hometown, talking about it to all of the visitors. So not just offering museum services to them, but empowering these women so that they can voice their opinions and interpretations. We also accommodate visitors with special needs. For example, here uh, visitors who are visually impaired are touching museum objects, sometimes with the help of museum docents, sometimes with the help of uh, audio description, a uh, visual description audio guide, or visitors with um, um, hearing impairment are uh, watching a video uh, with sign language interpretation recorded on our audio guide. Or on the right, one of our docent tour is being translated uh, simultaneously by a sign language uh, interpreter on her side. We try to accommodate these uh, visitors with special needs. We also realize sometimes our audience are handicapped by long distance or by their ill health. They cannot come to the museum because they are too far away or not healthy enough. So we also bring our museum educational programs off-site in our outreach programs to very remote schools and sometimes to hospitals or to nursery homes where uh, senior citizens uh, who are not healthy enough or who may be suffering from Alzheimer's disease came out from their rooms to have a wonderful and fun day with museum educators. We even went into prisons, adult and juvenile prisons, because we realized these prisoners are really, really very underserved and underrepresented in museums. Because they are handicapped by their imprisonment, they cannot come to the museum freely. So we took our educational programs to these prisons. Here our museum docents are giving tours to adult prisoners as well as juvenile prisoners. So, what do museum educators do nowadays? They also have to provide far more varied forms of educational programs than ever. We want to engage our visitors to make sure that they participate and interact. We want to be entertaining and educational in order to stay connected. We also want to accommodate different learning needs. We want to encourage our visitors' interpretation as much as possible. So here are our docents, instead of giving regular tours, sometimes they have to dress up as uh, ancient Mongolian prince and princesses in their tours in order to make their tours more entertaining. Or sometimes we have actors and actresses do the job. Here is a young actress dressed up as uh, Jade Cabbage, which is one of the most popular and famous uh, museum objects, giving tour to a group of children. We know some of our visitors pre prefer creative activities in learning, so we provide uh, hands-on or art uh, workshops. And we also know that our children, our young generation, are more and more technology inclined. So here you see two young women, young girls, are painting directly on tablets, on mobile devices, where their paintings can be directly projected onto the painting on the screen. We also provide multi-sensory experiences so that visitors with different learning needs and preferences can benefit. So instead of just uh, looking at museum exhibitions, hearing tours, reading explanations, they get to hear the sounds of Chinese bells, smell the, uh, smell the flavor of traditional Chinese incense, and sometimes they get to exercise their sense of taste. But Unfortunately, not in our galleries, just in our classroom. So here they made a chocolate cookie that they get to eat afterwards. And the chocolate cake uh, cookie is based on the shape of an ancient Chinese animal motif on the right. Or sometimes they move their whole bodies. Um, here, family members, uh, parents and children are simulating the shapes and strengths of Chinese calligraphic strokes by posing different postures. 
And we want to hear multiple interpretations in multiple voices. So in, we encourage our visitors to provide their own interpretation. Here, one of our high school volunteers is giving his version of a museum tour by comparing the museum objects to Pokemon monsters. Or here, this summer we provided um, a series of photography workshops to teenagers. Teenagers were asked to take pictures of objects uh, on display in the shape of animals or with animal motifs. They not only took the uh, photographs, they also had to provide their personal interpretations by designing uh, dialogues for these objects. So for example, the one on the top uh, is about uh, the very small mouth of a fish-shaped jar. And the teenager was inspired by the very small mouse. He's pretending that he's pouring water from his water bottle into the mouth of the fish. And the dialogue says, fish, help, I'm dying of thirst. Water bottle, no worry, I'm coming to save you. So he's calling the visitor's attention to the mouth of the fish-shaped jar, but using very, very modern teenage language to uh, interpret it. Beneath, uh, beneath it is a very flashy looking pottery pig. And the dialogue goes, I'm not fat, I just have larger bones. Once again, they are calling our attention to the very flashy quality of the pottery figurine, but using very, very teenagers' uh, language. And on the right is a very strange-shaped uh, dragon cast on an ancient bronze vessel. He's calling our attention to this very strange-shaped animal by saying, I may be ugly, but I'm kind at heart. Eventually, these images will be pieced together, connected into videos, and then we will post them on our website or on our Facebook. Um, you're welcome to watch them, the complete works of art. Um, we are also hoping that by posting them on our, our website and social media, we'll be attracting other teenagers or people who are equally young at heart to feel less intimidated by the daunting amount of information associated with the museum objects and feel comfortable to interpret and look at the museum objects in a new light. But is it enough? Sometimes we um, wonder, uh, particularly confronting a new generation of, of new visitors who are increasingly more technology inclined and busier on social media, sometimes we wonder if all of the above mentioned services are enough, and sometimes we have to venture into the use of expensive and new technologies such as AR and VR. Or we get very, very busy on social media, on YouTube, on our Facebook, sometimes busier on social media than on site. But when I look at a picture such as this of young boys and girls looking at their Pokemon Go games on their cell phones, um, not, not being aware of what's uh, happening around them, I wonder to myself, as museums busy themselves uh, with uh, providing services online and on the phones, are these technical development actually attractions to appeal to these young visitors, or are they actually distractions? Do we want our visitors' eyes up as the visitors on the right in order to observe, compare, contrast, contemplate, and wonder at our objects, or do we want their phones up and get too busy taking pictures and selfies without really looking at the, the objects. Particularly when we know that sometimes they get carried away and forget that they are in the museum. For instance, this young woman who accidentally knocked over exhibition cases recently. Uh, I'm sure you have all uh, seen this video posted on YouTube because she was too busy taking selfies or pictures. So when we provide and endorse this selfie picture taking frenzy, are we being trendy to the new visitors or are we waiting for disasters to happen? Are these new te technological developments um, a necessity or are they an extravagance? After all, not all of us work in big museums with big budget. Can we keep up with newer and newer technical appliances? 
I'm not saying that technology is a bad thing, not at all. Uh, certainly museums are no strangers to the use of technology. We have used technology for, for a very, very long time. These are just questions that I reflect upon in my everyday practice as a museum educator. I'm sure you all have questions, similar questions in your everyday practices as well. I'm just reminding us here that we should always keep in mind that we should not fall into the trap of using technology for technology's sake. We should be smarter and wiser than that and tell, can, can tell the differences between a necessity and an extravagance. We should always remind ourselves that technology is only a tool, one type of tool, and it should always be used with educational purposes in mind. And Technology may be fancy, may be trendy, but it cannot be. It certainly is not the only solution to stay connected and relevant to our young audiences. And here today I'm going to share with you another solution. That is the creation of emotional experiences, particularly with the help collaboration with school teachers. We have the capability of not just engaging the visitor's mind, but also reach out to their heart. We can bring our museum services to their classrooms and even to their homes. When we speak of um, emotional museum experiences, the first thing that comes to mind is perhaps an uh, exhibition that have very, very strong emotional themes, exhibitions that provoke strong feelings. But that's not what I'm going to be sharing today. What I'm going to be sharing is um, museum um, educational programs that help our visitors connect to our collection. Even though our collection may be very ancient, very old, very remote to modern audiences, that help our visitors connect to these collections effectively. I'm going to quickly mention Benjamin Bloom's three domains of taxonomy. I'm sure perhaps all of you are familiar with it, particularly if you are school teachers, you are probably already uh, combining all of the three uh, domains in your teaching plans, cognitive, affective, psychomotor. But uh, with museum educators, or at least museum educators in Taiwan, we still uh, place more emphasis on cognitive and psychomotor activities because we get carried away easily with providing information as much as possible to our visitors or we get carried away with designing and providing hands-on art workshops type of activities and not place enough emphasis on the effective domain. So how do we define effect? Uh, it's a very complex term. I'm just going to define it very, very simply here. Effect may include feelings, emotions, attitudes, values, etc. And here is where the museum educators have a chance to touch our visitor's heart. Um, we also learn from constructivism, and constructivism influenced the museum scholars that reasons and emotions, in fact, are intertwined. They cannot be separatedly. We shouldn't separate the cognitive from the affective uh, size of uh, the educational experiences because we always think cognitively and affectively at the same time. And emotions are important in learning, particularly in the free choice learning setting which the museum provides. So let's see how we can engage not just the visitor's mind, but also to reach out to the visitor's heart. I'm I'm going to share with you two examples where we worked side by side with school teachers uh, to do that. The first project uh, is a collaboration with a reform school in Taiwan. We helped young offenders or teenage prisoners relate to Emperor Qianlong's collection effectively. Emperor Qianlong ruled in the second part of the 18th century. He is a key figure of building up the museum's collection. The second project is a collaboration with uh, a primary school in the museum's community. Uh, we worked with school teachers to design a teaching plan for fourth graders and help them relate and interpret Emperor Yongzhen and his motto, no haste, be patient. I'll be coming back to those four characters, no haste, be patient, in just a few minutes. Uh, but incidentally, Yongzheng Emperor is Qianlong Emperor's father. He ruled in the first part of the 18th century. Now, first of all, 
The first collaboration project is with a reform school. Reform schools are located within juvenile prisons in Taiwan because young offenders are um, required to continue with their middle school and high school uh, education, even when they are detained in juvenile correctional institutions. So in 2014, the museum had a chance of uh, bringing an exhibition of replicas together with educational programs to one of these reform schools. Uh, the theme of the exhibition is I see Qianlong, you saw a glimpse of what the uh, exhibition looked like. But there's also a sub-theme that everyone has the potential to become Qianlong in the modern world because everyone has the potential to become just creative if you begin to learn the wonderful potential of his collection. So here I'm going to show you how Qianlong's collection, even though it's 300 years old, can still be a very trendy source of inspiration even today. On the left is an example of a palace memorial. Palace memorials are reports written by uh, Chinese uh, officials reporting things big and small to the emperors. The emperors would personally read these comments and would sometimes write down his personal commentary as well. Sometimes they would write down very, very lengthy comments, such as the one you see in red ink. Sometimes they just simply wrote down three Chinese characters, which mean thou art understood. And below it are four versions of thou art understood, the same three characters written by four different emperors. Now, thou art understood is a non-committal statement. It simply states, I have read your report. Nothing more and nothing less. But the three seemingly ordinary Chinese characters somehow inspired a modern Taiwanese design company to produce these paper tapes printed with the three Chinese characters. And somehow they became extremely popular with our young audiences that they always sold out very quickly in our museum workshops. So this is proving that even though the palace memorials and the three Chinese characters may seem insignificant and ordinary at first, they can still be a very creative uh, a source of creative ideas. And the success of this uh, paper tape inspired museum educators and reform school teachers to design this art workshop where young offenders are trained to make traditional Chinese pastry printed with the three characters. Now this is um, Chinese, traditional Chinese uh, sweet cakes. So in the workshop, they are learning the skill of making this pastry, which may be a useful skill eventually because some of them fancy uh, a pastry-related uh, career if they have a chance to leave uh, the juvenile correctional um, institution. And they also learn, of course, something cognitive about the facts and information about the emperor's life, how they graded and commented on the palace memorials. They learn about the importance of the three Chinese characters and the success story of the paper tapes. But more importantly, they learned something effectively about themselves. Because as you see on the picture on the left, their first attempts of the pastry is not very successful. It's not as easy as it seems at first. It was only after a very long process of try and error that something better can come out of it, as the examples you see on the right. They learn in the process to confront their um, limitations, to challenge their limitations. They also learn that if they don't give up quickly, if they stick to it, eventually something nice will come out of it. So a century-old museum object becomes a connection to these young offenders, how they look at themselves, how they confront their own weaknesses effectively. Another part of the educational program is the training of young offenders to, uh, as docents to give tours during the exhibition. These young offenders either volunteer themselves or were recommended by their reform school teachers. The NPM educators provided uh, facts and information about the uh, works of art on display. We also practice uh, public speaking and tour giving uh, skills with them in practice sessions. But the young offenders were specifically encouraged 
to develop their own tours. They shouldn't just memorize the facts and information provided by museum educators. They should bring in something of their own by uh, providing unique personal experiences in their interpretations. They gave tours to the following visitors. Uh, first of all, they gave tours to their parents. The parents were invited to hear their tours. And these are often very, very emotional moments when parents first came to hear their tours. They were so pleasantly surprised by the f performances. They couldn't believe their children could master this amount of information and can interpret the emperor's collection in their own words. So here you see a young woman who's talking to a crowd. And her mother is actually hidden in the back. She's looking at um, her daughter uh, in a smiling face. Some of them will be so touched and moved by these pleasant surprises that they will burst into tears. Um, um, and of course, their reactions to the uh, young offenders' tours is also a great boosting of their self-esteem. They know that their parents now begin to see them in a new light. They also gave tours to their classmates, other young, offen other young offenders, teachers, and staff of the reform schools. They even had opportunities to give tours to regular school groups and community uh, members who were invited to see the exhibition. And of course, all of these uh, visitors who came to see, uh, hear their tours gave them very, very positive uh, feedbacks, which in turn boost their self-esteem. So they began to see themselves in a new light as well. They came to realize that they really have potentials that they didn't realize they had originally. I'm going to show you some of the examples where they actually put down in writing of their personal interpretations of these museum objects. I think it's best to let them speak for themselves. Here is one boy who was inspired by the revolving vase made in the Qianlong period. Now, the revolving vase is a vase within a vase. If you rotate the neck of the vase, you can also rotate the inner vase at the same time. It's a very complex and difficult technique in ceramics production. And this young boy was inspired by Qianlong's uh, determination to master this difficult technique. He said, Qianlong Emperor did not want to father, follow others' footsteps in ceramic productions and created the revolving vase and vase within vase techniques. I see a Qianlong that challenged himself and was not afraid of proving himself. I used to shy away from challenges, but even an emperor who already had it all took down challenges to stay creative. Shouldn't we try much harder to prove ourselves? So here he's um, bringing his personal inter interpretation and making personal association with a museum object 300 years old. He interpreted it as a symbol uh, to prove himself to stand up to challenges, to conquer his previous weaknesses of giving up too easily. Another young woman was uh, particularly inspired by this uh, imperial summer hat, and especially the symbol of the hat finial, which is the top part of the hat. She said, the hat finial decorated with the eastern pearls reminds one to not forget one's heritage. I may not have eastern pearl finial to wear like the emperor, but I have a go on my head. I must rectify past mistakes, the only way to show gratitude to my mother and teachers. Mistakes are not shameful. What is shameful is having no regret. So once again, she's uh, making personal associations, effective association with her past mistakes, what brought her into the juvenile prison in the first place. And she's interpreted the symbol of the half female as a symbol for herself, that she has a goal. She must make things right in order to have a better future. So here, objects, stories of museum objects and stories of the young offenders are interwoven. Together, they connect the museums, reform school, parents, other visitors, and the young offenders together. Even though Qianlong Emperor may have lived 300 years ago, his uh, collection may be very ancient, we can still make connections to the young audiences today through these emotional experiences. The next example that I'm going to share with you is a collaborative project within elementary school. 
Now this time we worked with interdisciplinary teachers, teachers from art, history, and Chinese language classes all worked with uh, museum educators to develop a teaching plan for fourth graders um, for the exhibition Emperor Yongzheng and his times. Now I understand that the Thai people still retain a very, very close relationship and have lots and lots of respect for your royal family. But the last emperor in China stepped down in the early part of the 20th century. And for children of uh, Taiwan today, emperors, their lives, how they rule their country is a very, very abstract and distant and difficult topic. So let's see how the teachers brought these topic and relate them to modern children of today. It's also very interesting to note that uh, out of all the objects from the exhibition, they choose two of the perhaps least visually appealing works of art. One is the emperor's very official portrait. The other is a wooden plaque inscribed with four Chinese characters, which says, no haste, be patient. The four characters were given by the emperor's father to him when he was a young man to remind him that he should tame his bad tempers because em Emperor Yongzheng was very famous for his bad tempers. The emperor uh, inscribed them on the wooden plaque, hung it in his study as a constant reminder of his father's teaching. So let's see what the teachers do. In the first part of the teaching plan, uh, the, the teacher and museum educators told the children that the emperor is actually a workaholic. He worked very, very hard. He often read and commented on the palace me memorials until the middle of the night. And incidentally, we also discovered that sometimes the emperors like to pose himself in different auteurs and have court painters paint him, for example, in the auteur of an European gentleman. We have no idea why he did that, but one speculation is that this is perhaps for his personal enjoyment. Perhaps he was so stressed by ruling the um, empire of China, he wanted to entertain himself from time to time. So this is brought into this part of the teaching plan. Children were asked to put themselves in the emperor's shoes and to imagine what they would suggest the emperors do. If emperor were to live in 21st century Taiwan, what they would suggest him to do in order to relieve pressure. One boy suggested that perhaps the emperor can try fishing to release pressure. So here you see him dressed up as a fisherman with a fishing rod with four fish in the basket. The other children, uh, the other boy suggested that perhaps the emperor can try playing basketball with his staff. This way he could not only release pressure, he could also build strong binding relationship with his team. Now, this is not about making fun of the emperors, not at all. This is uh, asking the children to um, be in the emperor's shoes, to try to use their imagination and life experiences from the 21st century to suggest to the emperors what he can do to release pressure. And in the process, children developed empathy and perhaps even sympathy for the emperor's very, very hard job. The emperor was no longer just an abstract historical figure. Now he became a real person with real problems to solve, and they can sympathize with some of the very hard decisions he made in order to run the empire uh, of China. The second part of the teaching plan is about this uh, four-character motto, no haste, be patient, and the motto plague. This time, children were asked to go home and discuss with their parents what their children would put down for them if their, if their uh, parents were to write down a personal, tailor-made motto for these students, what the parents would put down. So for example, a mother put down um, the example on the right, honesty and modesty. And then children had to discuss with their parents why those four characters were chosen. And this young girl wrote beneath it that she can understand why her mother picked those four words because her mother expected her to be a honest and modest person. It's really important to be honest and modest in the modern world. Another parent wrote down always a smiling face. So in the discussion process with their parents, children came to realize that these mottos are not about nagging 
at their mistakes. This is uh, uh, a way of their parents to express their love, concern, and expectations. So we are building, binding the family uh, parent and children's relationship. And they also came to realize that Emperor is a real person to his father, is a real person, they are a real family. They also have true feelings that his father was also expressing his love, concern, and expectation through the four character motto. So once again, an emperor who lived 300 years ago and his very ancient uh, collection or his not very visually appealing uh, looking motto plague began to make personal associations with children and their family. And museum educational experiences did not just occur on site in museums, it went into the classrooms and even went into the uh, children's homes. So the objects of the stories are interwoven with objects of this family. We would hope that they would, from now on, look at the collection of Emperor Yongzheng and his life in a different light. That they would always see Yongzheng's uh, motto plague and reminded themselves of uh, this school museum uh, joint venture that they once partook as a family. And maybe they will continue to discuss this memory within the uh, family. And there we see a young girl. Um, children had to bring back these motos in, um, in the art class and make them into modern moto plaques. She's holding always a smiling face in her hand. And these modern moto plaques, of course, is a reminder of the family's participation in the museum edu uh, educational activity. I have shared with you uh, the two statements issued by AAM earlier on that uh, they uh, have greatly shaped my early role as a museum educator. I'm going to share with you uh, this uh, museum uh, association's report on museums change lives published uh, in 2013. We now realize that museums are not just learning institutions. We actually are expected to change people's lives by doing all of these things. This is just one page that I posted from the report. To do all of these things, of course, we need partners. And today I shared with you our experiences of working collaboratively with school teachers. They are our wonderful friends and partners. So coming back to the topic of my presentation today, can museums change lives? Yes, I believe we can, and actually we are doing it already every day. By working hand in hand, museums with museums, museums with school teachers or other partners, we can change our audience's mind, we can change their heart, and also change their lives for the better. So let's work together and continue to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lin, for your terrific presentation. But please just remain on the stage for a while, for some participants might have questions and sharing. ขอบคุณคุณลินมากนะครับในการนำเสนอมีท่านใดอยากจะถามหรือแลกเปลี่ยนความเห็นไหมครับผม uh, Any of us would like to ask a question? Yes, please. Um, thank you, Ms. Lin, for um, inspiring accounts of your museum. I'm particularly interested in the, um, the juvenile offenders event, um, especially the, what is it, the, the a vest in the vest and um, the other program. So how how do you help them make the connection? Because I mean, now we see like inspiring product of the program, right? But we don't see how you create that connection for them. Do you have a lot of interpretations going on for them? Have telling stories about those objects in advance? Yeah. Um, when the museum educators first went in, of course, we provided uh, the cognitive side of uh, the um, exhibition. We provided facts and information about all of these works of art, including stories of the objects. But the important thing is, you know, at first they tended to just memorize all these fact sheets that you gave them. But we specifically asked them that they should provide something 
of their own by drawing on their life experiences. So that's how you see they make personal relations. Everything they made, personal interpretations and relations, were drawn upon their life experiences. For example, why they um, shied away from uh, challenges in the past, that they shouldn't do that anymore. By standing up to challenges, maybe he can make his life better. He's actually uh, learning from the story of the object, but also interpreted it by associating with his own life. Or that, how the half females symbol, uh, it has a different symbol for the emperors, of course. It's about heritage, but the young woman associated with her responsibilities and goal to make her life better for the future. I hope I answered your questions. It was a lot of discussions. You had to ask them to bring out your personal interpretations. And of course, I didn't have time to talk about peer uh, influences. They also work together as uh, groups with their uh, friends, classmates from uh, the um, reform schools. So they also inspired each other. Okay, okay thank you. Any more question or sharing? Uh, well, thank you very much for your most inspiring uh, presentation. Yeah, yes. Okay, I'm here. Yes. Um, now, as I'm um, an old woman, I'd like to ask a question about old people, senior citizens. Uh, I mean, your examples are about creating learning space for uh, uh, elementary school children and young offenders. What about old people? From your experience, do you find that old people learn in a different way or you need to use different approach, different kind of engagement with older people? And can you give some examples from your experience? Uh, thank you for the question. I only had time to discuss two examples today, and I chose to focus on school-museum collaborations. Um, but I did uh, show you some of the pictures of the educational programs that we do for senior citizens. And one of the ongoing projects is by bringing uh, museum replicas to the nursery homes, because the sense of touch is very, very important particularly for people who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And we are training with uh, psychologists and therapists in order to prepare our educators and docents uh, uh, to better perform these educational programs. But um, we have collaborative uh, relationship with several nursery homes. We are still continuing to do that. The other thing that we are uh, attempt uh, trying a lot in these past two years is by asking the senior citizens to come with their family because we realize that sometimes they may not come on their own they need company of someone they love and know so sometimes we have programs designed to have all three generations grandparents parents and children to join together. Or sometimes we have programs designed for senior citizens and their hair, uh, caregivers. Many of the caregivers, in fact, are immigrants from Southeast Asian countries. So we want to reach out, not just to the senior citizens, but to their very, very important caregivers at the same time. So uh, the format of the educational uh, program can be very varied. It has to depend on the, once again, different learning styles and differences, different types of audiences that we confront. Mm -hmm. They can be hands-on activities, creative activities, or lectures and talks and discussions, any kind. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Any more questions? We still have some five minutes for this session. Yes, over there. Hi, um, thank you for uh, inspiring uh, presentation. Um, particularly, I'm interested in uh, multi uh, voices or multi narrative um, idea that you have implemented in your museums. And as museum professional and museum planner, I see that a lot of Thai museums still uh, positioning themselves as a institutions that providing the truth, the fact, the only fact, <laughs> and which um, 
as we see that in the West or uh, the trend around the world is um, promoting multi voices or multi narratives in a museum setting. Um, I would like to ask you if you have any tips <laughs> for us uh, that we can step up to that to be a uh, common practice because I still see that um, to uh, for curators uh, that working um, in, in this uh, um, education, they still see that um, there should be nobody else that should be interpreting their story or this object or h how would you like make them feel comfortable and elaborate this uh, idea to the to the next level? That's a very, very important question. And I think one of the tips to it is to don't shy away from our challenges. We should learn from our young offender. We shouldn't shy away from the challenges. We should stand up to these challenges. Of course, it's an ongoing uh, battle and journey. And the other tip is perhaps to start with the younger curators. They are very young at heart themselves. You, know, you wouldn't believe it, but some of our curators uh, Facebook every day for us. They post even funnier messages than educators sometimes. And they have young children themselves, so perhaps they can relate to some of these programs more easily. And that is also the reason why we chose to start from teens. Because uh, it's cute, right? Um, they can say anything they want. People wouldn't object to their teenage interpretations so much. And also, we started from our website and Facebook instead of putting the interpretations directly in front of the um, objects. We're starting from the virtual online experiences first. Uh, we, of course, is also a very dogmatic museum sometimes. So it's an ongoing battle and journey. The final tip I suggest is perhaps to follow in Anna's example of embedding, if possible, education within the curatorial departments. We all envy that. If you do that, perhaps it will become easier in the future. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we can't have any longer time for this session. Um, once again, thank you so much, Ms. Lin, for your terrific and wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, and please give thanks to her. Um, now we're going to have a short break for 15 minutes for coffee and tea. So, and then please come back at 10:45. Thank you. ก็พักดื่มน้ำชากาแฟ15นาทีครับแล้วก็กลับมา 10:45 ครับผมขอบคุณครับ